Welcome to the Walled Garden Podcast. Here, we nourish the gardens of our minds, one meaningful conversation at a time. If you'd like to find out more, go to thewalledgarden.com. Thanks for joining us. Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Walled Garden Podcast. You know, we have quite the backlog at the moment of really great interviews and conversations and lessons that have been given uh, in the Walled Garden community. There's plenty of episodes to be released. Uh, If I had more time on my hands, I'd probably be doing two or three episodes a week at this stage, but um, nonetheless, we're going as fast as we can here. And uh, this month, we have some really great events coming up in the World Garden as well. So that backlog is going to get uh, even longer. But, uh, you know, we've got conversations with Shane Trotter coming up on reversing human devolution. We've got a conversation with Ryan Driscoll from the uh, Stoic Warfighters podcast talking about Stoicism and the military. Uh, That's going to be a conversation with uh, Leonidas Konstantikos as well, who I'm sure that many of you have heard and love. Uh, we've got a conversation with Ranjini George, a lecturer and professor at uh, the University of Toronto. She's going to be talking to us about what we can learn from a Zen monk and a Roman emperor. We've actually got a conversation coming up in April with Karen Duffy, the actress and uh, proclaimed Stoic as well, uh, on her new book that's coming out. And we've got some other meetups that we're planning uh, for this month coming up as well. But... Today, I actually wanted to do something a little different. You know, I was recently talking with uh, one of my coaching students and uh, just a, a, a beautiful human being who I adore. He will know if he's listening to this, who he is, but uh, he's a trumpeter like me. And we were talking about the situation that is unfolding over in Ukraine the immense human cruelty that we see on our screens at any moment, you know, if, if we decide to look. And if you do decide to look, and if you pay attention, you'll probably find yourself wondering how you might make sense of it all. you know, we we have this tendency in modern times to be pretty optimistic about the human spirit, you know. Well, of course, there is a general feeling of cynicism, you might say, uh, everywhere. But still, I, I believe that most people are still in this kind of haze, this dream where they believe that we've somehow moved past the human capacity to wreak havoc on a mass scale. And there's many reasons why we, especially in the West, might feel this way. You know, one of those reasons is, let's go into the symbolism of the walled garden again, you know. We live in walled gardens, We live in concentric walled gardens. Uh, Your nation is a walled garden. It's the place where your ancestors worked tirelessly to build walls and to build systems of government and to build organizations and processes and all kinds of things that would shelter you from having to see the terror that lay just beyond the gates. And when you've lived within that walled garden for so long without ever journeying beyond it, uh, what ends up happening is something like what we can take the most visceral example of this, the trade towers falling in 2001. You know, that was a penetration of that wall that kept the garden safe and flourishing. 
And so everybody understandably looked at that and had no idea how to make sense of it. They had no idea what to do with that information that, you know, if you abstract it out, a dragon had entered the garden and desecrated a temple, you know. And people obviously looked at that with a sense of panic and dread and how could this possibly happen, surprise. And now with the internet, delivering information at the speed it does. And, we, you know, we are all able to see beyond the walls of our garden at any moment. Now, the difference is that there's a disconnect there because we can see, but until it hits your shores you know until until the dragon comes knocking at the gate and you have to deal with that the question is do you really understand what you're looking at when you look at what's happening beyond the walls of the of your garden you know on a more personal level i've mentored people who live in very very safe countries and then they go on a holiday and they have a frightening experience or something that really shocks them, you know, wakes them up in, in a sense to the chaos that, that lies beyond those walls that keep them safe in their safe nation. And, and they come back from that holiday and, and they wonder how to make sense of that. You know, they, they still feel that, that, that uh, recurring vibration, you might say, of the stress from that moment and and when I've had this same conversation with him what you've what you've been in touch with there is the chaos that lies outside of these safe walls that that protect you and until you actually come face to face with that I won't pretend that I have in any real sense or any real way I I don't know how I'm going to uh, react to many of the great challenges that I'm sure lie just beyond our walls over the next few years. But as I say, until you've actually experienced that, you know, do we really know what we're looking at when we see on our screens, when we listen through our headphones to the various horrors that are always unfolding and sometimes more than others now seems to be one of those times where we're seeing an escalation in the terror that we see outside these safe walls of what you might say is western culture and so we have to learn how to make sense of what we see despite the fact that it has not yet come to our gates. You know, the Stoics give us this very interesting idea that to the sage, nothing is a surprise. To the wise man, nothing catches him off guard. Everything is anticipated. You'll remember, likely, that Seneca calls us to not only imagine everything that we think might happen. No, he makes it very clear. Imagine every possibility and potentially even every impossibility and live as if those things are likely to happen. Because if you do that, then nothing is a surprise. Things may move you, things may tug on your heart and make you feel deep sorrow for the human state, the human condition, and for those who suffer, of course, but they will not be a surprise. You will understand that they are a part of the human experience. There's no way around it. And you know, our great religious and philosophical 
traditions. They, you know, if they are truly great, they give us a foundation to stand upon so that when we are faced with the kind of information that we constantly see flowing through our screens into our ears, you know, we know how to at least in part make sense of it. And when we can make sense of it, then we can perhaps have a firmer foundation to stand upon when we make our next action, our next moves. What, what can we do about this, if anything? Many of you will know that I've been exploring the kind of Judeo-Christian tradition as I've begun studying the Master of Divinity. And one of the things that has fascinated me so much about the Christian tradition is, you know, the Bible tells this very interesting story of the patterns of existence, the patterns that manifest themselves on more levels than just the surface level of our lives, you know, on on, on almost every level of existence this kind of wave-like pattern where, well, I've described it in the past as going from deserts to gardens, deserts to gardens, you know. That's certainly a pattern of humanity. What you might say is that humans have the tendency to fall into the greatest depths of hell and somehow we manage to claw our way out of hell and into luscious gardens, or what you might call something approximating heaven. And the idea is that the responsibility is upon each and every one of us to ensure that we are doing what we can in our lives to aid the flourishing of humanity. But the way you do that is by recognizing that that desert garden pattern exists deep, deep within you as well. That you, like I, you know, find yourself at all times flowing like a wave upon the sea, sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes high, sometimes low, sometimes participating in virtue and thus in a state of almost uh, heaven, you might say, and sometimes participating in vice, which only brings you and everybody around you down. And again, it's our responsibility to say, well, what can I do? to make sure that I am truly aimed at the highest good, at virtue, at the kingdom of heaven, you might say. What can I do? Because you might think that if, if everybody has that capacity to be intentional to be attentive to where they are at any one moment and to call themselves, drag themselves up to a better way of being. And if everybody would commit to that, if everybody would commit to doing what they can do in this moment to aid the flourishing of their own souls and thus hopefully the flourishing of humanity, how good could things get? And so this is what I'm talking about with this pattern that you see in something like the Bible. And I'm not an expert on anything, you know, uh, let alone Christianity. Uh, I'm not an expert on on any other, you know, world religions. But I do know that this pattern is is one that finds itself in, in many, many traditions, though it may be spoken differently or written differently. You know, this pattern shows us what is happening when we look at the terror that is constantly unfolding around the world at any one moment. And for that matter, uh, for that matter, uh, the, the, the terror that we see within ourselves when we so desperately want to 
make progress in the right direction. But there is a part of us that holds us back at times, that pulls us into dark caves, that pulls us down. And we are constantly in that battle. You know, to the Stoics, it was the battle of wisdom against folly. Seneca said, you know, wisdom and folly, they're taking separate sides. Which will I choose? Which will I choose? I've been deeply moved to see just how morally prepared it seems many people in Ukraine are for this tragedy that is being forced upon them. And when I say morally prepared, I mean look at the courage that we see from people over there. Look at the Ukrainian president, Zelensky, you know, fighting on the front lines with his soldiers. That's courage. That's moral wisdom. So let me ask you, when we listen to conversations about philosophy, when we read the Stoics, when we practice philosophy, what are we doing? Are we mouthing the words? Are we doing what I believe Chris Fisher once said? He said, are we, you know, merely playing Roman? Might have been somebody else who said that, but it's an important idea nonetheless. Are we just playing the Romans? Are we pretending to do the work of philosophy or are we truly with every part of our being trying to move closer towards virtue, trying to truly seek wisdom. Because if there's anything that you might take away from looking at what is happening around the world right now and for the past few years, perhaps what you might take away from this is to finally, once and for all, wake up to the fact that it's getting awfully hot down here. And it's upon each and every one of us to do what we can do to strengthen and fortify our own souls and to see what we can do to aid the mutual flourishing of our families, our communities, our organizations, our religious groups, you know, our nations, so that when the dragon comes to our gates, which it will, we will not say, this is a surprise and I was unprepared. So, going back to my conversation today with uh, one of my clients, uh, he really inspired me because what he said was that he had been 
very moved by what is happening in Ukraine and he lives over closer to that area and so it affects him more and he has family in places that may be affected at some point. And he was wondering what could he do, what could he possibly do? And he told me that he was planning to go down to the Russian embassy and play his trumpet outside the embassy playing the Ukrainian national anthem. You know, for the past two weeks, I've noticed a massive increase in the amount of people who I've talked to who have encouraged me to be vulnerable, to deliver up the goods of my soul, to share the totality of myself. These are people who truly know me, people who truly care about me and, and care about the direction that I'm going, the, the, the adventure that I believe I'm on, what you might call the mission that I believe I'm on uh, with this podcast and everything I'm trying to do. And I've been taking this very seriously because you might think that if, if you truly believe in the Logos, this interconnectedness that binds everything together, if you truly believe that we as human beings are a hive and that, you know, we in many ways live for each other and we, we lift each other, I mean, you, you'll pick up on messages when you start seeing them more often, you'll pick up on patterns when you see them more often. And this seems to be one of those patterns. People are encouraging me, encouraging me saying, go on, deliver it up. And I think that today talking to my client about him going and playing trumpet outside the, the Russian embassy, I thought, well, that's the straw that broke this camel's back. It's time for me to start delivering up the goods of my soul in service of the highest good, in service of you, in service of humanity, you know, because so often I find myself, you know, listening to certain people and watching certain people and I... I've always had a, a very strong ten tendency to admire and to, to uh, imitate, you know. And I, th I think it's because, and I'm sure that many of you will see this in my work, I, I, I'm always trying to figure out what's, what's better, what's better, what's better. Who should I admire? Who should I imitate? Now, this is good because it's allowed me to really explore what I believe would be the ideal character of an individual. But there's also a downside to it, which is that sometimes you watch other people and you think that you should be what they are. But if you really pay attention, A great sage, a great wise person, a, you know, a great, you know, mentor, a great teacher, a great, a great human. Really what they're showing you when they're being great is that you need to inhabit your own individual greatness. Not to be like them, but to be fully you. All the way. And when my client said that he was going to go play his trumpet, it just reminded me that music, poetry, writing, you know, these are my methods of communication. This is how I speak most authentically. And I can get bogged down in the daily duties of running this podcast and everything that I'm trying to do. I'm taking on way too much, as you guys know. And I'm trying to rectify that 
issue within my soul as well. I, I know that that's, that's certainly a vice, uh, trying to uh, overcrowd myself with busyness, but there are some things that are more important than others. And I'm learning how to come back to that place and to participate in what is more important. And so instead of releasing an episode today with an interview, I wanted to deliver up to you guys an epistle that I wrote to the modern Stoics. Some of you may have read it by now, and if you have, then perhaps this is the place where we say goodbye, but you're more than welcome to listen on. If you haven't already read this, it's on modern Stoicism. Uh, By now, I've also posted it on the Walled Garden, but I'd encourage you to go over there and uh, support modern Stoicism and check it out there and check out the other great works that they're doing. And it was a pleasure to be invited to, to write this for them. I've been putting off reading this to you guys for a couple of weeks now. And now just seems like the appropriate time. And although this piece does not specifically relate to the current unfolding events in Ukraine, it does very much relate to the intensity of our times. And I hope that what you get from this piece is somewhat of an invitation to take life very seriously, especially during these intense times, and to take this pursuit of wisdom very seriously because I just don't think that we fully comprehend how much is riding on our collective development of wisdom in our individual lives. So here goes. Dear Stoics, I should begin by saying that it is an honour to be writing to you all at the kind invitation of Harold Covley and Gregory B. Sadler of the Modern Stoicism Organisation. I have immense respect for both of these gentlemen, for I've been given the good fortune to have interviewed each of them on multiple occasions, and our conversations have always been profitable. I've spent a good deal of time considering the topic that I should wrestle with in this first letter to you all. For an invitation like this is a rare treat, and one should therefore meet it with great discernment. As such, I shall endeavour to do as my teacher has often instructed me. I shall offer you the goods from my own storehouse, and I shall seek to realign what is human in me with what is divine about us all. Our common spark that, if fueled appropriately, might become as a burning beacon for all mankind. And if I should aim to speak in the same spirit as the wise teachers of our past, and not merely with the same words, I must first call upon poetic insight and say, Friends, gather round, there are stories to tell, and lest ye now hear me, we'll all go to hell. So sit round this fire that I'll light with my flame, and let us seek heaven's true riches and fame. And to those who are cautious or wary of style, gather in all the nearer, take heed for a while. And to those who judge harshly, I welcome thy wrath, for I too am a sick man, seeking cure on my path. And to those who judge lightly, now wake from thy dream, great treasures now lie at the bed of this stream. So to those who now hear me, I pray for thy souls, that we all may soon rise, singing praise to the whole. And if it should be that we all close our eyes, and block up our ears, and dress in disguise, and if it should happen that none will be saved, and that none shall awaken from this dream of our days, then this fate I'll accept, men go down with their ships." And we'll all sink together till the spirit of our God-forsaken culture flips. It's precisely here where I'd like to tarry a while, for I wish to speak freely about the ailments that so fiercely beset our collective soul or our common human culture. 
whichever you please. Throughout the most recent months, I have spent considerable time discussing cultural matters with Sharon LaBelle and Kai Whiting, two individuals who are, in my estimation, either wise or at the very least far less prone to folly than I. I feel incredibly grateful that I have this opportunity to be moulded by two individuals such as these, for they seem to complement each other in the most fantastic ways. Sharon, on the one hand, sees beauty wherever she looks, and her capacity to deliver deep wisdom at the right moment and in the right tone never ceases to inspire me. She, more than anyone I know, understands the necessity of the unknown element, the mystery and the adventure. In short, she is a true artist, and her canvas is life itself, and I am but a lucky portion of that canvas upon which she now paints. Kai, on the other hand, offers an altogether more academic element to this meeting of the minds. He is rigorous in his study of Stoicism, relentless in his efforts to lift those around him who he deems to be on the right path, and courageous enough to point out folly where and when he sees it. This I have learned from bittersweet experience. But what impresses me most about these two glowing souls is their shared desire to not simply regurgitate the wisdom of our ancestors, but rather to be practitioners of this wisdom. In our most recent conversation, for example, Sharon, Kai, Toma, a fellow seeker in our community, and I discussed a passage written by Ralph Waldo Emerson at the beginning of his essay, Nature. Here, Emerson revealed the spirit of his time by writing, and I quote, Our age is retrospective. It builds the sepulchres of the fathers. It writes biographies, histories, and criticism. The foregoing generations beheld God and nature face to face. We through their eyes. Why should not we also enjoy an original relation to the universe? Why should not we have a poetry and philosophy of insight and not of tradition, and a religion by revelation to us and not the history of theirs? End quote. In the conversation that followed from our having inspected this passage, we all agreed that this philosophical landscape that Emerson spoke of was not merely a time in our distant past, but is rather a recurring pattern that reveals itself in the records of our culture. After all, we find echoes of this same message within the tradition of our own school. Seneca, for example, was clearly aware of the human vulnerability toward philosophical regurgitation disorder, and you can consider that term coined. He said, quote, This is what Zeno said. But what have you yourself said? This is the opinion of Cleanthes. But what is your own opinion? How long shall you march under another man's orders? Take command and utter some word which posterity will remember. Put forth something from your own stock. End quote. Now, before you catch me out here, I should note that I'm fully aware of the inherent irony in my having just quoted Seneca telling us to say something for ourselves. But nonetheless, the point stands firm. The human condition is such that we are at all times liable to become mere readers, but never knowers, seekers, but never finders, listeners, but never hearers, lookers, but never seers. For this reason, I am now compelled to turn my gaze to our own time and place and to ask you, do we not live in a time such as that which Emerson wrote of? And are we, students of Stoicism, not guilty of the same vice that Seneca warned us of? Look around you, my friends. We have inherited a tradition and philosophy that suggests a path to personal flourishing, or by a more popular term, enlightenment. But who among us has planted their flag at the top of this mountain? Who has known virtue? Who has communed with the gods? 
Who now lives in agreement with his nature and even with the nature of the whole? Who has laid hold of their own personal freedom? Good heavens, my friends, who among us can see that we are taking part in a metaphysical gold rush? I say, take your pans and sift through the mud, for that which is most precious is always found in the murkiest depths. If my own assessment of the state of our modern philosophizing is not enough to stir you to your senses, then simply take a look around you and see what has become of our human culture over the past two years. My brothers and sisters, can any of us truly say that we were surprised to see how quickly the masses could be led into the darkness? Come now, let us reason together. Was this not foretold? Did our ancestors not teach us that we must anticipate even the unimaginable? Did they not plant seeds of wisdom within our hearts, even that we might see clearly the path before us? My friends, our ancestors are nearer to us than we imagine, for they saw these cosmic patterns, and they communed with God, and they sought eternal knowledge, which is, in my estimation, more than one could say of us. Yes, it is true. The masses now wander over desert sands, and we have been exiled from the luscious gardens we once tended in our souls. And we have fallen out of alignment, and this sickly state has been born of our own ignorance, and our own pride, and our own affinity for vice, and our own foolish desires that lead us into pain, confusion, and division, both internally as well as in our families, communities, and nations. Make no mistake, the foundations of our human culture have for some time now been revealing fissures and cracks, and this foundation is now being pushed to the breaking point, and it is beginning to crumble beneath our feet amid the weight of our technological advancements and our moral failings. My friends, no matter how far our intelligence takes us, it will all have been for naught if we cannot match this intelligence with an equal or greater portion of moral wisdom. Some of you may say, Who are you to play the judge of our culture? Are you so sound of mind and clear of sight as to know good from evil or right from wrong? To this I say first that in taking aim at the larger... I am also taking aim at the lesser, for a culture or a god is, if anything, an organ in the body of the one, and the cultural organ is made up of people just like you and me. Therefore, we must penetrate first our own hearts, even that we might be stirred to good health, and even that our own perfecting souls might send ripples into the upper realms." Let me reason with you again, asking, Is this not the precise time and circumstance for which we have been preparing in these past years and decades and centuries and millennia? Has it not been the single task of all great philosophers and theologians to discover the truth of their age, and hopefully even the truth of all ages, even that the future generations might have a rope to hold onto when the foundations beneath them turn to rubble? I beg those of you who have eyes to see and ears to hear, nurture these seeds, all ye who seek wisdom for thy harvest, and it will be given to you. And thou shalt pile it up in thine storehouse, even until it floweth over for the whole village to partake of thy bounty. So, brothers and sisters, it is my hope and claim that we now live in a time of providential revelation to mankind, and that this has always been the case, though we have often been blind to this fact. If as much is true then the song I shall sing is one which calls us to arms in the service of what is holy, what is sacred, what is good, what is pure, and what is divine. Yea, let those who seek true knowledge, even oikaiosis and even eudaimonia, 
Step forward and love this fate which we all have been dealt. For the salvation mankind is in need of will not be given to thee by the gods ye now worship, and nor will it be found by the distracted traveller, and nor the prideful student. Lo, the path of heaven is narrow, straight, and readily accessible, but men do not perceive it. For they are cursed with wandering hearts and wayward desires, and if I were to be bold... I would even go as far as to suppose that if the sage were to reveal the universal way, it would be a miracle beyond measure if we fools could see that path which the sage revealed. This, in my estimation, is all the more reason to pursue such a knowledge. To those who have courage, walk now with me to the front line. But bring not thine earthly weapons. For the battle we now prepare to fight will not be fought on land but in the heavens and within the heart of each individual who seeks victory. Bring rather with thee the strength of thy mind and the power of thy heart and the song of thy soul. For such weapons need not draw blood to win the most important battles. Therefore, let us waste no more time in this vague sleepfulness that we now find ourselves in, and let us rise above these human challenges we now face, employing wisdom against folly and virtue against vice. Even that we might be listed among the heroes of our day, if not in the records of mankind, at least in the lists of the gods. When others seek division... Let us seek unity of purpose and value. When others are motivated by hatred and anger, let us respond with humility and love. When others fear death and cling to their vices, let us fear folly and let us cling to the sure path of virtue. To those who have attained knowledge, suffer well the fools among us who still seek and employ tact when you teach. For there is nothing a fool loves more than to deny truth in service of his pride. But as Marcus Aurelius showed us by example, it is the task of the teacher to find the path to the heart of the fool. And most of all, let all of our hearts set sail in the direction of Seneca's harbour. For it is here where our exile comes to an end, And it is here where we may rest on the calm waters of eternal knowledge, inner peace, and the oneness of all wisdom. So now, let me offer one last call to arms in this divine battle, speaking in the language that comes most naturally to the forefront of my lips and to the tip of my pen. In times of tribulation, when the dragon's at the gate, when great men fall ill with folly, and the masses are full of hate. The wisest fool seeks wisdom, and he searches high and low, and he looks in every cave or forest in the great below. And as he nears the highest peak of the mountain in the centre, the masses see him shining as the heavens he doth enter. My friends, it is true that I came for the show and I came for the praise and I came to be known, but lo and behold, something precious I've found, hidden down deep in the cold winter ground. And I've dug and I've dug till my hands start to ache, and I've gathered this treasure, an idol to make. But this idol is sacred, for it oft points the way toward the sun shining brightly at the peak of God's day. So seek ye this wisdom, and join the wise fools who persist in their folly till God gives them jewels. And if it should be that great wisdom ye find, then return to this village and share the luscious gardens of thy mind. (laughs) 